Uh, as I mentioned, and most importantly, uh, Arnold DeBorger, my boss, is actually the one who came up with this project idea. Just about a year ago this week, he had dinner with General Petraeus. Uh, the two of them sat down with their wives uh, discussing a number of issues, and the general spoke to Arno about the new uh, supply routes that were being um, put down across uh, Russia, Central Asia, um, Azerbaijan, and Georgia. And Arno engaged him in discussion of what the geopolitical implications were um, of, of these networks. What would it mean by putting these lines through there? What would it uh, have for an effect on the larger relationship? What might it mean for trade and for the future of Afghanistan? So Arno uh, brought that to us, Dave and I, and we sat down and engaged Andy on this and said, we, we need to stand up a working group and look at what all of the implications are on that. So at the time of that discussion, uh, we had just established the Northern Distribution Network, uh, the second corridor for transport into <laughs> Afghanistan. Obviously, complex relationships between the United States and the transit states, coupled with an expanding Taliban insurgency in Pakistan, resurgent militancy in parts of Central Asia, made us concerned, made us nervous about what these new supply lines might mean. What sort of security would we have, both on a political level, but actually on a logistical level? <coughs> so over the course of the research, we realized that these were significant risks, but the long-term potential of these supply lines were tremendous, and that gets to the notion of the, uh, the modern uh, Silk Road. And as we'll show, the new supply lines are the first step in a broader effort to develop Afghanistan's economy by integrating it more fully with the neighbor, its neighbors across greater Central Asia. Um, today's presentation will be broken up into four parts. Uh, the overview that I'm doing right now on how the, uh, and will do on how the U.S. military actually gets its supplies. So just a, a, an understanding of how we move these massive amounts of supplies into Afghanistan across very perilous uh, routes in some areas, but over very, uh, very um, stable routes in other areas. Um, then we will go to the <coughs> geopolitics of the NDN, the Northern Distribution Network, and the transit corridors that come into Afghanistan. Then Section 3 will discuss the broader strategic implications and opportunities that are created by the NDN. And that's really the, the, the heart of our study here, is what do these networks um, promote and what do they stimulate for the long term? And then we'll talk about our uh, recommendations to policymakers. Incidentally, this is, as I mentioned, a three-part project. This is the culmination of the first phase. We're going into the second and third phase. I'll let Andy make a couple of comments about that. Um, and then Steve Benson will bring in his uh, component, uh, as I mentioned here, on the, uh, on the modern activity gap. So why don't we go to uh, the slides. <coughs> So to sustain the growing level, uh, force level in Afghanistan and the current level, US, United States and ISAF, again, 42 nations in Afghanistan, have to pr uh, bring in a tremendous amount of material into the country. This is a national tasking. That means each country is responsible for bringing in their supplies. We are not bringing in supplies for those 42 nations. We bring in our own, and countries take care of bringing in uh, the rest of their supplies for their own forces. The bulk of non-sensitive, non-lethal U.S. supplies um, are routed through Pakistan. They enter uh, the port of Karachi, and then they go up a single line that then splits into uh, two other lines, one that goes into Torkham Gate and one into uh, Shaman Gate in Baluchistan. Torkham is uh, <coughs> up at Peshawar. Uh, these supplies are handled entirely by commercial carriers. These are not U.S. military trucks, two-and-a-half-ton trucks that are carrying these supplies. These are local uh, trucking uh, contractors that provide uh, the transportation for these uh, products that come in. In 2008, to give you a sense of how much it was brought in, just in 2008, this is before uh, the uh, first um, increase in troops by President Obama and, of course, before the 30,000 <coughs> latest round, but it included 28,000 20 foot equivalent units. And if you've seen, if you look at the cover, you see the, the uh, containers that are brought in. So a 20-foot equivalent unit, uh, one of those containers filled 28,000 of those, made it through uh, that single supply line from Karachi up to those two points of entry in Afghanistan. So a tremendous amount <clears throat> that was brought in. So as I mentioned, as the Pakistani, uh, the Taliban insurgency in Pakistan intensified, those routes came under increasing pressure. We've all seen the pictures. We'll show you one right here of what happened to some of the, the supplies that, uh, that went in. And again, these are non-lethal supplies. These include vehicles, uh, but nonetheless, these are not 
um, some of the more sensitive uh, pieces of equipment, night vision goggles, um, uh, weapons, uh, ammunition that are being brought in on these lines. These are, these are supplies that are considered non-lethal. <clears throat> but 450 vehicles were destroyed uh, in an, over a dozen attacks between September 2008 and March of 2009. This particular picture shows 100 trucks uh, that were loaded with ISAF supplies that were destroyed by militants just outside of Peshawar in uh, December of 2008. <clears throat> so a lack of projected surplus capacity along the Pakistani routes in conjunction with the attacks you see here, pilferage, uh, trucking strikes, the exorbitant costs associated with airlifting supplies uh, into Afghanistan uh, prompted the United States to consider new supply <coughs> routes coming into Afghanistan. And ultimately, the United States decided after a series of uh, discussions on routes that connected the Baltic and Black Sea ports uh, with Afghanistan. And we'll take you through some of those maps now. The first line in the, in the main line, I think we would call it, would, uh, would be the, the uh, Northern Distribution Network North. And this begins in the um, uh, port of Riga in Latvia, crosses Russia on Soviet-era rail lines. Uh, it's up to the individual commercial companies to choose the routes that they want. There's not one single line that uh, we send our uh, supplies on, which uh, of course is, is excellent for security, but also just allows the commercial carriers to take the best routes possible. From Russia, it goes into Kazakhstan, obviously, in Uzbekistan. Once in Uzbekistan, you can see down at the bottom of the uh, aqua-colored uh, um, country, obviously, Uzbekistan, it enters, ter uh, ends at Termez and enters Afghanistan uh, at that point. <clears throat> Slide six, please. NDN South enters the uh, Georgian port of Poti, goes across Georgia into Azerbaijan, to Baku, across the Caspian Sea on a rail ferry, up to Oktau, on the Kazakh coast, and then takes the same route, or same general route coming down through Uzbekistan. A third route, um, KKT, um, Russia, and then into Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, avoids Uzbekistan, um, completely, uh, again, providing redundancy to our routes. Uh, according to Transcom, this is a, 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 an essential route, but the, the roads through Tajikistan are problematic. I was on some of those roads recently myself, and they range from roads that are as bad as Washington, D.C.'s roads to roads that are like a billiard table. They're perfectly smooth, so a real range um, that, that somewhat limit uh, our capability. From a purely logistical standpoint, NDN has been a resounding achievement. We have moved a massive amount of material, not only through the Pakistani routes, but through the NDN routes, uh, very important. Currently, 320-foot equivalent units are transiting NDN per week. So 300 of those containers transiting per week, though the cost, we should note, very importantly, is two and a half times as much as sending them through the, the Karachi route, through the Pakistani route. Um, but that's a price you pay for redundancy and security and uh, for capacity. Um, the number of TUs that could go through this route, through all the NDN routes, could be expanded to 500 per week if needed. As of November 2009, the NDN had brought in 4,500 TEUs, again, 20-foot equivalent units, into Afghanistan. This represents 12.5% of the total number of TEUs shipped through Pakistan in 2008 and is additive to the supplies currently entering Afghanistan from Pakistan. As you know, with any introduction of forces, there's a bow wave of initial supplies coming in to set up facilities to house the new troops. Now, those are, amounts are not going to be constant, but to set up for the initial forward operating bases, the expansion of other bases in Afghanistan, you have the initial uh, supplies coming in to actually create the infrastructure for those forces. So there's a huge push at the very beginning of any new uh, troop increase into a country like this. Over to you, Andy. Thanks, Tom, uh, for being you're more concise than, uh, <coughs> than I expected. So I guess I'm ready. Good morning. Uh, delighted to be here, and uh, I'm really uh, delighted to have uh, uh, taken part in this project, um, which has developed into something uh, far larger uh, than uh, I certainly first imagined when uh, Arno and Tom approached me uh, back, in, back in March. Uh, and I'm very grateful uh, to them that they did because this project has really been, for me, one of the most interesting uh, projects I've been involved with uh, since coming to Washington uh, and before then in my you know, career of trying to do uh, policy-relevant research. 
and it also afforded me the opportunity to learn about a lot of new things that uh, I was not that familiar with. Um, I think one of the one of the, the first the first gotcha moment for me on this was when in May we went down to uh, uh, Florida for a, a briefing with the uh, CENTCOM guys uh, about the uh, NDN. And they were very, very happy to see us and see that there was somebody that was interested actually in this, this project. And uh, they also understood and the uh, much larger, I think, strategic implications and potential uh, for the NDN. And, and for that reason, they were especially glad to, uh, to talk to us. And at one moment in the conversation, they turned to us and said, so as we're talking about you know, this kind of larger vision of what kind of gets us to the modern Silk Road and, and the role of trade and transit uh, uh, in the region and its importance for Afghanistan and how NDN demonstrates how the possibilities to some extent uh, for this, they asked the question, so where's the belly button in Washington you know, for thinking about this in a really strategic way? I said, I look, we looked at them and said, you're asking us? Uh, you know, it, where is the central node that is kind of trying to put all this together? The economic implications, the strategic implications, the uh, obviously the, the, the military uh, supply implications, which drives drives the whole thing, which occupies their time. They could see the much a large much larger picture, but of course their f hands were entirely full with simply trying to get the logistics job done, which is a massive job. And uh, uh, I had not uh, really any familiarity with uh, logistics, but uh, I came rapidly to appreciate uh, the comment that I think. Uh, Steve Benson said to me, uh, Andy, strategy is for amateurs. Logistics is for professionals. <laughs> um, so with that, uh, I have the responsibility in our presentation for talking about some of the, geo the various geopolitical interests, which is the subject of uh, uh, the report that just came out uh, this week, uh, Geopolitical Challenges and Opportunities. And so I get the, uh, the chance to say all the uh, controversial things that are going to piss very piece various people off. But <clears throat> that's a role that I relish. Um, we knew that the creation of the NDN was going to create, uh, have an impact on Eurasian geopolitics. That was obvious. It was going to make the US and NATO uh, dependent on different transit countries and in turn giving those states some leverage uh, with us. We also thought it created a real opportunity uh, and that there were common interests of, of uh, many states involved in the region regarding the stabilization of Afghanistan and the creation of the alternative uh, supply routes created a, a concrete opportunity for cooperation on a real security priority for the, United, for the United States, a tangible mechanism for transforming those common interests into actual cooperation. I think this is particularly true and important for, uh, for Russia and the Central Asian states involved, and it's uh, kind of part of the larger notion of reset. Reset is typically only applied to uh, the Russia relationship, but I think the, uh, the, the notion uh, applies here as well in th that this gives us something really concrete uh, that we can work together on with these, with these states. And this is particularly true with uh, Uzbekistan, which is really the linchpin in Central Asia uh, for this. Um, so over the next few minutes, I'm going to uh, briefly survey the primary interests and points of leverage uh, for the NDN transit countries as well as uh, China and Iran. And I'll try to do this as, uh, as telegraphically uh, as possible so we leave as much time for discussion as, as, as possible. Uh, next slide, please. So let's start with Russia, uh, the country I know most about, purportedly. Well, uh, not surprisingly, Russia's interests uh, in the NDN and Afghanistan more broadly are extremely complex and, and mixed. Uh, if I were to boil it down to one sentence. Uh, I think that, uh, as you can see from the list of bullet points there, there are uh, clearly interests the Russians have in, in stabilizing, stabilizing Afghanistan. Uh, but there are, Russia also has brought other interests in uh, maintaining influence uh, and control to the extent possible uh, in Central Asia. And sometimes, clearly, these interests uh, come into conflict. And uh, I think the most uh, obvious instance uh, over the course of 2009 of that was the, uh, uh, the dispute over the Manas Air Base and the role that uh, the, Russian, the interest of the Russian government uh, uh, had, in my view, uh, in their preference in that we uh, uh, not have access uh, to, that, uh, to that base, which of course now has been renamed to a transit, transit center. Um, 
Uh, to what extent does Russia want to see Afghanistan fully, fully stabilized, I think, is also a question worth, worth exploring, because I think the, uh, the interests are mixed. Uh, and certainly some of the uh, uh, Central Asian states, most notably Uzbekistan, um, would argue that uh, the Russians don't want to see Uzbekistan, uh, Afghanistan fully, fully stabilized because uh, they see that if Afghanistan is stabilized, they understand that this will open up trade, transit, economic corridors to the south, giving the Russians uh, less control over the direction of uh, trade and trade and transport for those states. And also, many in the region argue, not only the Uzbeks, that, uh, that sometimes this is used by the Russians. The threat of terrorism uh, and insecurity is used by, by the Russian government as a justification for the maintenance and expansion of Russian military presence in the region. Uh, and I think that was also very well demonstrated this summer in the, uh, the dispute between Russia and Uzbekistan over the uh, proposed new CSTO, which was to be a CSTO, uh, base uh, for the Rapid Reaction Force in Osh, which eventually uh, the Uzbeks opposed, and eventually the deal was it was a bilateral deal between Kyrgyzstan and, uh, and Russia for that, for that base. Um, I, this, while impossible to, to, to quantify uh, for sure, uh, I can't help also but thinking that the the memory, the experience of the, uh, of the Soviet war in Afghanistan back in the 1980s and the role that the United States played in directly uh, undermining Soviet efforts uh, uh, is a memory that is uh, not too far back in, the, uh, in sort of the collective memory of the Russians. It's hard to say what, what the influence there is, and I'll just leave it at that. Let's go to Central Central Asia. Um, for Central Asia, and I'm going to speak of, in, in, telegraphically and therefore somewhat, somewhat collect, collectively, and obviously the interests of the various states uh, differ uh, to, to, some, to some degree, but uh, I'll first note what I said at the outset, the, the centrality of Uzbekistan. All of these new routes established um, you know, go through Uzbekistan at the point of the, the Uzbek-Afghan Afghan border. Um, and I think, again, the, uh, the notion of a reset, especially for Uzbekistan, their relations with the United States have been on a roller coaster, uh, to put it mildly, for the last, the last decade. Uh, this really uh, is an opportunity to uh, reconfigure the security uh, relationship and also the, uh, the more broadly the bilateral relationship to some extent. So interest. Well, first of all, there's uh, interest in, in balancing the partnership amongst regional and extra-regional powers. By contributing to the Afghan war effort, the Central Asians are currying favor with the United States and NATO, and to some extent weakening the leverage of other states in the region. Uh, secondly, money. Well, the U.S. military needs represent uh, uh, a source of revenue uh, for local shipping companies, service providers, farmers, manufacturers, rent-seeking governments, uh, and others. And certainly there's a strong interest uh, in those states in greater local procurement uh, along the, uh, the NDN. And we have a number of recommendations there in the report that we probably won't, we're not going to get to in the, uh, the presentation, but you can look, look into. And obviously, the, st the issue of stability in Afghanistan. Uh, increased stability in Afghanistan reduces the flow of drugs into Central Asia, deprives other regional terrorist groups of stor an historically important operational hub. Uh, and again, in the larger picture, it, uh, a stable Afghanistan opens trade routes potentially potentially south, and also reduces the rationale for uh, Russian military presence uh, in, in Central Asia, which is of interest uh, to some. Let me just say one, to go back on this reven revenue question, uh, and back, back to Russia for a second, and you don't need to go back on the slide, but uh, the, the revenue flow, this, this drive for Russia is quite, quite significant. And uh, one of the interesting data points that emerged in our research was learning that, you know, in the wake of the, uh, the war with Georgia in 2008, when the U.S.-Russia relationship virtually came to a standstill, uh, one of the only uh, pieces of cooperation that continued was the role of, of Russian uh, heavy lift air carriers, uh, Volker Dnieper, other companies similar, similar to that, in uh, supplying for, uh, material into Afghanistan. It's a big business. Uh, they're making about a billion dollars a year. And uh, that was not discontinued by the Russian government in the wake of all of the tit for tat. Uh, 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 back and back and forth after, after the Georgia War, 
And that's a pretty significant uh, point you might want to return, return to. Okay, central, uh, the Caucasus. Um, well, let's look at Georgia uh, first, first and foremost. Uh, and uh, certainly there is a strong U.S. interest in strengthening security ties uh, with Georgia uh, as well as Azerbaijan and generally in the, in, the, uh, uh, in the Caucasus. And obviously this is a higher, uh, this is a more urgent matter in the wake of the, uh, the Georgian War uh, of 2008. And just to put the, uh, back to the larger picture of, of NDN, um, it, it is true that the NDN is considerably more expensive uh, way of getting uh, material into Afghanistan than through, through Pakistan. And in fact, and the southern route is, is even more expensive uh, than the northern route of the NDN, getting material uh, for various reasons. Uh, certainly, if Turkmenistan were to uh, sign on to the NDN, which they have not as of yet, that would help to diminish the cost somewhat of the southern route, but it would still leave it considerably more expensive uh, than the northern route going through uh, Latvia, Russia, Kazakhstan, etc. And, you know, there's an important political uh, uh, rationale for the, for the southern, southern route. Uh, you know, one, generally the NDN uh, in the transit corridors, more are better, more alternatives, more redundancy is, is better. That gives the main client, the United States government, the U.S. military, more leverage, more uh, 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 freedom of op opportunity, um, and that's all good. But I think also uh, in the case of the uh, N NDN South, it's important to keep in mind that uh, uh, there is an important security rationale for uh, NDN South in helping to strengthen the ties of those states involved uh, with, with the U.S., particularly in the wake of the, uh, the Georgia War. Um, the, uh, uh, I'd say uh, in the case of Az Azerbaijan, I'd also want to, want to point out that, um, I mean, Azerbaijan, and particularly Pre President Aliyev, has a, a broader vision of the future of uh, Azeri economic development in which Azerbaijan's role as a trade and transport hub is a major, major piece of, and that's part of the larger economic diversification strategy of Azerbaijan, and the NDN helps to, uh, to demonstrate that uh, for them. Uh, the points of leverage that uh, the, uh, the states have are, are similar to what Central Asia and, uh, and Russia has. Of course, they can turn the off button, uh, but I think in the case of uh, uh, Georgia and Azerbaijan, it's uh, less likely uh, that that would uh, that, that would be a concern uh, in the, as opposed to Central Asia and the Russian, the Russian cases. But I would also want to point out that there is some concern about the uh, so-called frozen conflicts, uh, and particularly the role of Nagorno-Karabakh, if something were to happen there, or if something were to happen even in Abkhazia and South Ossetia and another, another uh, military conflict in Georgia, that would be a severe problem for, for the NDN. Okay, quickly, uh, move on to the next slide, Latvia. Um, <clears throat> Latvia and the port of, port of Riga is the, uh, is the entry point uh, for NDN North, as uh, Tom, Tom pointed out. Uh, Latvia also uh, sees this, uh, its role as a trade and transport uh, transit hub in the future is extremely important for its economic, economic development. Uh, and of course, uh, this is also a way for uh, the Latvian government to strengthen its security relationship uh, with NATO uh, and, uh, and bilaterally with the, uh, with the United States as, as well. Let's turn to, uh, to China. Uh, China is not currently a uh, uh, transit state for the NDN. Uh, when we first embarked upon the project, uh, there was, I think, greater optimism that the Chinese uh, government would sign on uh, to the NDN and open up a, a route coming in uh, through, the, through the east. Uh, <clears throat> in our latest discussions with uh, folks at the Pentagon, uh, apparently the Chinese government was still studying the proposal um, and has not, has not signed on to it. Um, you know, broadly speaking, uh, I think that there is a, some degree of strategic ambivalence on the part of the Chinese uh, government regarding Af Afghanistan. Um, I don't think that... Uh, uh, you know, the, the fact that uh, U.S. military forces are, uh, are bogged down and uh, heavily deployed in Afghanistan and, uh, uh, and Iraq uh, takes some of our attention away from uh, uh, areas and theaters of uh, direct interest to, to, the, to the Chinese. 
Uh, I think, as was pointed out in a very, very good article uh, a week or two ago in the New York Times about the INAC uh, coal, uh, excuse me, copper mine, which the, uh, the Chinese have, uh, have made a, are making a huge investment in, about three, three and a half billion dollars. You know, to some extent, I think the, the Chinese interests principally in Afghanistan uh, and Central Asia more broadly, of course, are access to natural resources, energy first and foremost, but not, not only. INAC coal mine is a good, good example of that. Uh, the Chinese have been uh, active in developing uh, infrastructure uh, to some degree in the region. Um, but I think as our non-present uh, uh, star, Fred Starr, uh, commented in the article about the INAC coal mine, I think there may be a feeling to some extent that the Chinese you know, let the United States do the war, dirty work of uh, bringing security there, and we can pick up the fruit uh, and the goodies, the economic goodies uh, for our, ourselves. There's, I think, uh, well, we also talked to some extent about uh, Japan's interest. Uh, I think it's interesting to contrast uh, the, uh, uh, the roles that uh, Japan and China have played. Japan has been the largest uh, provider behind the United States of assistance to Afghanistan uh, since 2002. And in fact, the, uh, the levels of Japanese assistance to Afghanistan are about 10 times, for example, what China has provided to Afghanistan. And of course, when uh, President Obama was in Tokyo uh, last November, uh, just before that, uh, the Japanese announced the uh, uh, new aid package uh, for Afghanistan of five five billion dollars over the next next five five years. Um, China much much less less involved uh, in that in that regard. We can talk about that more uh, later if, if you want. So I'm going on a bit a bit too long. Let me say a couple of words about Iran. Iran certainly is not a member of the NDN at this point, but when you talk to the logistics guys. Uh, CENTCOM, TRANSCOM, D DLA, uh, their eyes brighten uh, when they look at the possibility of uh, supplying uh, forces in Afghanistan through the port of uh, uh, Chabahar in the south. So this is the most direct, uh, shortest uh, way of getting into Af Afgan Afghanistan. Um, and uh, at least I think as the uh, uh, as the NDN was initially conceived, or these alternative routes have conceived, um, uh, Iran has been thought of as possibly, a, as, as, as a possibility, if the uh, broader political relationship uh, uh, were to uh, significantly change. Uh, Iran's interest in Afghanistan, and uh, you know, given the geographical and cultural proxi proximity, the long-standing warfare between Sunni Taliban and, uh, and Iran, a stable Afghanistan is uh, pretty directly viewed in uh, Iran's strategic interests. They're also deeply concerned about drug trafficking. About 30% of Afghanistan's drugs flow, flow to Iran. Uh, the balance of power in the region, uh, they are concerned again about uh, that uh, their regional arch rival, Saudi Arabia, would be able to stabilize and secure Afghanistan through its, 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 its proxies. And of course, Iran, Iran and Afghanistan have a significant trade relationship, economic, broader economic, economic relationship. More directly with the United States, the, um, and there was a considerable amount of uh, cooperation between Iran uh, and uh, inter the United States and the International Coalition in the fall of, fall of 2001, uh, which I won't go into. But on the other hand, it's true that uh, Iran has been supporting ta the, uh, the Taliban and, uh, and training ta ta Taliban fighters. And I think the larger picture here for, for Iran is that uh, in the relationship with us, uh, it is the the threat, the latent threat that they have that they could destabilize Afghanistan, destabilize Iraq, uh, if we are to push that much harder on the nuclear issue, sanctions, et, et cetera, that's uh, in, the, in the background. Um, so mixed geopolitical interests, but uh, the, the sum of this all is, is that what really came clear to us in the, in the project is there really seems to be an absence, actually, of a regional strategy for Afghanistan. Uh, on the part of the U.S. government, uh, in, in our view. Um, and we have, we think there are cons very broader strategic opportunities uh, created by the provision of U.S. forces in Afghanistan, and the argument's very simple. So let's get to that, I'll, let me run through that very, very fast. And it's basically the economy. Um, 
you know, with international assistance accounting for roughly 90 percent of all public expenditures in Afghanistan, you know, we have to ask ourselves whether we can achieve our long-term goals there without developing uh, the country's licit economy. And while we rhetorically uh, acknowledge that we, uh, we cannot, uh, it's not uh, clear to me and I think my colleagues that in fact in our policy that that is demonstrated. Um, so the obvious question is how best to foster economic, economic growth and we think a key piece that is missing uh, or not adequately addressed in the U.S. strategy toward Afghanistan is this vision of the role that Afghanistan would play in the development of a modern Silk Road. Uh, and you know, here it's our colleague Fred Starr who's uh, been the guru on this uh, for years. But this development, we think, A, it's happening and it's going to happen. It's going to have and it will have a transformative effect on, on the region. Um, and it's also something that the Afghans have explicitly identified as a core of their strategy in the Afghan National Development Strategy that was put forth uh, initially in 2006 and then again uh, in a more developed form in, 2000, in 2008. Uh, we also think that the development of this modern Silk Road uh, is, this is a real win-win situation for all, for Afghanistan and all regional country, countries involved. So if it's so good, why doesn't exist? it exist? And why doesn't, why isn't it a larger part of our, our strategy? And our research preliminarily shows that uh, there are various obstacles. They're political, they're bureaucratic in nature, there are infrastructure problems, those aren't the most significant problems. And we don't even think the security problems are the most, the most significant problems ne necessarily. But I think the fundamental point I want to emphasize, to me this is a, a classic collective goods problem. Because um, when we've talked to U.S. government officials about in fact, we were disappointed with that in the new strategy announced in early December by the Obama administration, that trade, transport, transit issues, this idea of the region as the hub of this, which would be the key to its future, uh, future uh, prosperity, was not, it is not a, a major priority in U.S. strategy. And the argument that we get as to why that's the case, and it's understandable to some extent, is look, we have our hands full of the security situation. We are allocating, you know, massive resources for this. It is already extremely controversial uh, in the U.S. Uh, political, uh, U.S. in the U.S. in the U.S. Politi politically, you know, it just it just you can't sell it, and we I understand that. Um, and also, it's those countries <coughs> that should that will benefit from it from the most are the ones that should take the greatest initiative. Well, that's true to some extent. I can understand that too. India and China are the foremost drivers of, or the beneficiaries of long-term of this, but the Central Asians, the Russians, the Iranians, uh, the Pakistanis, of course, everybody is a beneficiary of this. The problem, though, is that all of those countries have rather specific interests uh, regarding Afghanistan. Um, and often competitive interests regarding Afghanistan. And it is hard for me to envision actually that the stimulus for this could come directly from one of those, one of those players itself. It's a collective goods problem. Um, and this is the key role that we think the United States can play. And we don't even necessarily think that this would cost so much money uh, it may be more of an organizational, political organizational uh, issue. That really is sort of the essence of what we would be doing in phase two uh, and are now embarking on the project, is thinking more carefully about how you would develop and implement this strategy. What this means for, first of all, uh, what the U.S. government should do. First of all, trying to get it higher on the priority list for the U.S. government. Secondly, thinking about how the strategy is developed and how the U.S. government needs to be organized actually to implement it and thirdly, the, which is sort of phase three for the project as we think, of, think about, is what, um, what needs to be done internationally? What do the other regional players need to do? And how do you mobilize other regional players to you know, act in a way which is uh, more beneficial for the collective good, if you, if you will? I've gone on uh, uh, too long. I think on that point, I will uh, stop and turn it over to, uh, to Steve. <coughs> oh, Tom, sorry. Yeah, yeah, excuse me. I'll do the policy recommendation now, and then we'll turn it to Steve and, uh, and 
can wrap it up and, and open it up uh, to, to uh, you folks here. And we look forward to that. So um, moving on to policy recommendations. And you can find them on, I believe, page 12 of the report with the trucks on the front. The pictures are very similar, so they're a little difficult to uh, uh, tell, tell apart. But let me run through some of those policy recommendations, and then we'll, uh, we'll turn to Steve Benson. Um, they fall into two categories, uh, near-term recommendations intended to help the United States maintain the flow of supplies uh, to forces in Afghanistan, again, page 12 of uh, the NDN report. Uh, the second set focuses on how the United States can build the, on the opportunities created by the end, NDN. Again, we look at the NDN as stimulating these long-term trade and transport uh, networks that can bring Afghanistan into a long-term uh, economic relationship with its neighbors. So first and foremost, we feel that uh, the U.S. should recognize the potential benefits of the, of the modern Silk Road and make its implementation a strategic priority. Uh, so looking ahead in the future, develop that immediate strategy or immediately develop that strategy for the modern Silk Road, promote the MSR in U.S. strategy um, <coughs> and understanding that this cannot be a unilateral action. To be successful, we obviously have to bring in uh, the other nations. One of the first things that Fred Starr told us is do not play, do not ever leave the impression that you are playing a game over the heads of any of the states. You absolutely have to make this uh, a partnership project and bring everyone in from the, from the beginning. And as Andy said, identify and empower a lead U.S. government entity that is explicitly identified and empowered by the administration to do this. Ellie Krakowski, who's sitting in the front row here, is uh, leading uh, a major component of that phase two effort. We have gone around um, the U.S. government to the NSC, to state, to DOD, uh, and USTR uh, to discuss with these individuals this exact point. And so that is a tremendously important element of it. Um, let's go to the second one. Okay. Um, stimulate alternative corridors. Uh, given the extent to which the NDN has served as an incremental step towards this modern Silk Road, U.S. planners should seek access to other areas. Again, redundancy is key, but also spreading out the benefits and showing other nations what's possible is important. <coughs> so we suggest the following routes be considered, Iran and Afghanistan, China, Central Asia to Afghanistan, China, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Afghanistan, additional routes out of Gwadar, for example, uh, through Balochistan, and then India, Pakistan, Afghanistan. There are obviously major challenges associated with these routes. But then again, who would have thought two years ago that the United States would be sending military supplies across Russia and Uzbekistan, given how difficult the relationship was? And now we're sending thousands of units across these countries. So just because it sounds ominous and difficult does not mean it's not uh, possible. Focus resources on the key problem. Uh, the United States and other partners, stakeholders, should partner with local governments to tear down the bureaucratic obstacles. We've worked closely with the International Road Transport Union out of Geneva on this. They, from their trucking associations, tell us of unbelievable obstacles to go across these countries. The bureaucratic obstacles, the corruption, getting through all of the different checkpoints takes a tremendous amount of time. So the U.S. should push um, the efficiency, uh, corruption-resistant procedures, uh, most notably at the border crossings. Uh, to make this a possibility. Obviously, we understand that with the United States entering into agreements for the northern distribution networks, that things move smoothly and quickly across these countries. That's not the same story, obviously, for commercial carriers. The United States <coughs> military and the United States as a whole brings a lot of weight to uh, these negotiations. And so countries see it in their, in their interest to facilitate this and make it go like that. And in many cases, it goes very smoothly and very quickly. But we should, we should demonstrate that this can be possible for commercial shipments as well and should push that. Give Afghanistan the tools to harness the modern Silk Road, to enter into that, to, to lock into it. Any increase in illicit cross-border commerce uh, will not help stabilize Afghanistan unless there's a capacity within the country to levy official taxes on what's uh, being carried in and out of the country. And that is very important. The U.S., Japan is the second biggest donor, and other donors should work with the government in Afghanistan to build this capacity uh, so it marginalizes the informal economy and discourages corruption, which we know obviously is very high. Recognize that the MSR will benefit all of Eurasia. This, again, is not just about Afghanistan. It's not even just about Central Asia. This is about Eurasia and, in fact, benefits accrue to the United States and to the world, generally speaking. We should push that. We should show what those benefits can be, and we should bring individuals in and be able to articulate how that modern Silk Road can do that. 
By doing this, you would close what Steve has identified as the modern activity gap. And at that, I'll turn it over to Steve so he can discuss that point. Thanks, Tom, and uh, thanks, Andy. Um, I'm going to, my words are going to come back to haunt me here um, because uh, having been a logistician basically providing uh, warfare uh, supplies to, to troops land and sea over my career, I'm going to venture into the strategy piece where I will be an amateur. <laughs> but uh, in order to do that, I'm going to stand up and, and, uh, and go to the slide. Um, what, I, what I've done over the past <clears throat> four or five years is tried to find um, in my studies uh, a, a new dominant strategic feature that, that tends, that would replace or, uh, the Cold War's Iron Curtain. I tried to find it, I looked for it in terms of a barricade, in terms of a corridor, and I, I've come to this, this particular construct called the Magi construct which you'll find in the, in the, uh, in the uh, publication. Uh, and if you'll turn to uh, page two, you'll see a, a graphic in there that I'm not going to show. But put your eyes on that and find Afghanistan, and then we'll come back to that. So. Can you hear me? Yeah. So I used to use this graphic when I was in the Navy to, to emphasize how the world is so in, intense in terms of the literals. Um, seeing clearly on a white piece of paper, over one day, uh, what's put down here are the telecommunications around the world. This is a common graphic that's been shown since, uh, for, for the decade, um, past decade. I moved to Syracuse and became landlocked, and uh, I started to change my thinking about this graphic. It tells a lot. You know, what you have here is a northern corridor of modern activity that's been developed over thousands of years, and you have a gap in the middle here. And the gap, right smack dab in the middle of the gap, is Afghanistan. And you have the march of modernity on both sides. And you also have, you can find uh, all, all the activity that's going on around the uh, edge of this gap that deals with infrastructure in terms of transportation, uh, road, rail, uh, airports is significant. You'll also find that the major sovereign wealth funds with the huge trillions of dollars circumnavigate this gap. And you'll find that the key players in the closure of that gap, and that gap is closing, there's I think 10 million more cell phones in Iraq today than there was eight years ago. That gap is closing. And if you looked at it a thousand years ago, you would, and you used footprints instead of telecommunications, it would be the negative of this graphic. And what you're seeing is a vice, and it's closing down on these vulnerable countries. And the MSR, the catalyst for the MSR being the demand signal uh, unlike any demand signal for supplies that's ever been in this area, is pulling from both sides. And that can be leveraged. What would it be like if this gap were closed? What was it like in the U.S. in the mid-1800s? Between the coasts. When we looked to close that gap. So that's the fundamental uh, construct behind the Magi. The end of it is that if you look at 
the way uh, let's, the arc of instability has been depicted over the past decade or two decades, originated by uh, Zig, Zygmunt Brzezinski. <clears throat> if you look at that, the way it's been depicted and evolved, the Marine Corps strategies that, that uh, are prevalent they're showing now show this gap, this instability area coming and then coming up in here like this and then down here like that covering the whole uh, basic south of the northern corridor of modern activity, but expanding up into this gap. And then if you look at the way the Muslim extremists depict their caliphate, you'll find the same thing. And that's the arc of instability as it pushes up into this region. So there's a lot of forces that are uh, coming to play, and a lot of key players that, are, that have significant interests in this dynamic. And I'll close with that. Thank you. Andy, you have a comment to make? Well, thanks, Tom. I just wanted to add one thing to, to, to what Steve said, because it was more than two years ago that, that Steve came to me, uh, my office, with this uh, graphic. Um, and. Uh, I was very excited about it, and we've been thinking uh, over the last two years about how you would, you know, what, what to do about it, frank, frankly. Uh, and what was exciting when Tom and Arnaud approached me with this project is that I saw, I could see that there was the connection here with this. The one thing I want to point out uh, and add in, in conclusion is that uh, in getting, why getting back to the, our fundamental point that looking at a regional strategy for Afghanistan that, place, that places greater emphasis on uh, trade, transport, and transit issues uh, is important and why it's urgent right now is because the window is fairly, is fairly short for us. Um, you know, look, we are uh, plussing up the troop presence uh, over the next, the next year. Already in 18 months, there is the commitment to try to reduce, reduce that uh, the, the further plus up in, uh, in troops, as Tom illustrated initially, uh, is putting tremendous demands uh, on the, uh, the, the challenge of, of supplying, supplying, the, supplying the troops. You know, and what the NDN, we argue, is doing, it is, yes, it's creating demand. Yes, it's with local, local, more local procurement, it'll, it'll, it'll do more of that. Yes, and it is sort of demonstrating the potential uh, for this modern Silk Road. It's demonstrating the fact that Afghanistan is actually more accessible, I think, than many of us uh, conventionally realized, although we probably should have realized that with the, uh, the flourishing of the drug trade out of Afghanistan uh, around, around the world. But again, the point being the window, the window is short. And while, you know, what's, you know, whether it's two years, three years, five years, you know, when the, the demand for uh, the military goods to supply the troops redu reduces, then what's going to happen? Well, if we're not thinking today about that uh, and about the importance of these uh, transit, transit routes and how you develop them, both by building infrastructure, more importantly by breaking down bureaucratic, bureaucratic barriers, then I'm afraid we really miss an opportunity, uh, and it's an opportunity meaning the, 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 the punchline being that no matter how many troops we put in, no matter how much security we bring to the region, uh, we conclude that it will be short-lived if we don't pay much more attention to this side of the equation. Thank you, Andy, and thank you, Steve, for the presentation. Uh, before I open it into uh, q and I'd like to recognize Senator John Warner, who's joined us today. We're very happy to have you here, former chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee, who knows these issues inside and out and how important these relationships are. So before uh, I call on you, please identify yourself in your organization. I was uh, struck by what I think is the very correct analysis that for the people who are 
focusing on the northern distribution network, the goal is getting supplies to Afghanistan. And because of this, I think there's going to be a natural tendency not to want to raise controversial in issues with the states through which the network runs. And yet at the same time, you've pointed out that corruption, which is endemic and really part of the fabric of the states in Central Asia, is the main roadblock. So how do you see the United States government going about trying to attack this problem at the same time that it's trying to avoid uh, causing problems in its relations with the Central Asian governments? You are very right to point out the, the corruption. It is uh, very high in, in Central Asia and, and in other countries along this road. And you know, we, we don't mean to point fingers. We have our own problems with corruption. But it's, it's very significant here uh, in, in the transit states. Um, one of the ways we can hopefully reduce that is to show the benefits, both on a strategic level with the stabilization of Afghanistan, but on an economic level uh, for these states by showing how um, more quickly, trucks can uh, pass through these areas. What they can do as far as uh, increasing ties and, and stabilizing the area is one way to do it and bringing greater attention. Uh, Daniel Kimmage, one of our co-authors, and others have mentioned um, the importance of providing some level of transparency into the increased business and in, in, into the uh, um, networks themselves. That's very difficult where there's not a free pre press. Um, but there are ways around, and one individual suggested that we pressure governments to uh, put online um, all the transactions that are taking place across these countries. Again, this, we, we're not unrealistic here. This is very difficult to do in countries where regime preservation is the number one goal, and, and, and money is, is you know, coexistent with that. We don't recognize, we, we recognize the difficulty. We, we don't have the solution for it, but the, <coughs> To the extent that we can expand recognition of the, the value of the modern Silk Road and of the benefits of it, and to bring U.S. and international donor attention to it, then you do bring some amount of transparency to it. At least it's an improvement. Just to add to it, it's, it's a great question, Jeff, and there's obviously no, no easy answer to it. The only thing I would add to what, what Tom said at this point is that, um, you know, the same is true with Pakistan, uh, with, with the routes. You know who is who is controlling the the uh, the, the, comp the trucking companies which which you know uh, dominate the uh, uh, the the, tra the transit corridors. They're, they principally have ties, strong ties to the the, the Pakistani military. So the, it's not as though we're. Uh, <coughs> uh, I mean, this and this raises the the larger point, I guess, is that many people have kind of you know pointed out that you know. Well, aren't you creating a whole new set of vulnerabilities by opening up these new routes, I guess? Well, yeah, you are to some extent, but let's remember why we're doing that. We're doing that because we face significant vulnerabilities with the dependence upon this, this one route, um, and the one route uh, actually shares a lot of the problems that you mentioned as well. All the way back. Uh, Bob Castro with Lockheed Martin Readiness and Stability Operations. Something Steve raised uh, resonated with what I was going to ask to start with, which is can, can you all discuss the role of technology um, in facilitating this? Obviously, with cell phones and other things in other parts of the world, you can leap a generation. When you're talking about moving goods and logistics, sure, there's tagging, tracking, databasing, those sort of things that knock down barriers at borders and customs. But what other technologies can be brought to bear to make this a smoother transition across all these uh, competing interests? Just, uh, quickly, uh, you, you've, hit it, you've, you've hit on it, basically. It's, it's the, the modern technology that exists around the world, around that northern quarter of modern activity, expanding into the gap. And it's, not, it's, in some cases, nothing more than providing um, uh, rudimentary uh, uh, passport control. Um, nothing fancy, but, for instance, the, the Tajiks, they, they'd like that. They have a lot of immigration problems they'd like to control. They have a lot of transit a trade that is illicit that they'd like to control. So a lot of this technology can, 
can serve both interests, uh, those of uh, making the, the transportation corridor more interoperable and also making the, the countries themselves more uh, able to control internally what it is they need to control. In October, the IRU hosted a conference in Dushanbe. I attended it, and we drove down to the Afghan border and into Afghanistan. We crossed the Panj River Bridge, which the U.S. Uh, built. And they had excellent technology down there, very sophisticated equipment. Um, so that's a start. But that needs to be spread throughout the region uh, and at the border. So Dave and I drove uh, from uh, Tajikistan to Uzbekistan about uh, 18 months ago, and we went across a border that was very rudimentary. Um, and so th they do need that. Uh, the truckers themselves have excellent technology, but the nations themselves need this assistance. This is another way in which the United States can help, and, and donor countries and, and other partners. Eric, Eric. Eric McVeigh, the Institute for Foreign Policy Analysis. In early November, I was at a conference in uh, Beijing and somewhat surprisingly, the Koreans uh, and Japanese, maybe both, took the Chinese under attack with respect to Afghanistan, or at least urged strongly that they uh, get more involved, uh, not in sending uh, combat forces, but uh, in training personnel and so forth. And I wonder to what degree Afghanistan is amenable to that sort of thing, and maybe whether we are too. I appreciate you comment on that. I'll make a couple of comments since I, I follow the Chinese side a little bit, and I'm, I'm heading there tomorrow to ask some of those questions in, in Shanghai. Um, obviously, the, the Chinese are very amenable to in, investing in the country. I'm sorry, the Afghans are very amenable to the Chinese investment. They can bring in a, a mini Marshall plan, the, the likes of which the Canadians, the Kazakhs, the Russians, and the U.S. could not match for INOC. Of course, there are allegations of bribery, but nonetheless, they bring the complete package. When Andy and I interviewed uh, Russian and Uzbek foreign ministry and other officials on our field trip there, they sort of described the difference between the Russians, the Chinese, and the U.S. like Goldilocks and the Three Bears. The Chinese, uh, the Russians were too hot. They came in there and they were, you know, too aggressive. The U.S. was uh, too short term and focused only on security, but the Chinese were just right. They were quiet and long term. And that's for Central Asia. I believe Afghanistan is the same way. As far as what would we be amenable to and what would the Afghans be amenable to as far as Chinese training, I don't know. I don't know. But at this point, they certainly are not going to put any um, boots on the ground. But, and there is certainly some criticism to be put out there about the INOC deal in that the United States are in, and our 42 <coughs> uh, partner allies are losing the lives to stabilize Afghanistan and the Chinese can come in and get the investment. But that investment is important, too, because it's employing thousands of people and providing massive amounts of royalties to the government. Now, where those royalties go is another question. But nonetheless, that investment is very important for helping to stabilize Afghanistan. If you think about David Kilcullen's accidental guerrilla concept of where, you know, the Taliban gets its uh, foot soldiers, well, unemployed people frequently. So the Chinese component, the investment is very important. Andy, anything to say? Uh, I would just add that, I'm, I'm, first of all, I'm glad to hear that uh, uh, I think the criticism is, is justified uh, to some extent. This probably was evident in my the way, the opening remarks. Not <laughs> That's not surprising either. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, I think, you know, none of us are, are, are China experts, so we're on uh, thin territory. But I think, first of all, I think it, it what the Chinese are doing in Afghanistan with a focus on, the, on uh, specific projects, with INAC being the kind of the, the, uh, the showcase, I think it's a, it's a demonstration of, uh, of kind of the a core, the, the core uh, economic rationale and driver of Chinese foreign policy uh, across the board. Uh, it's, I think what they're doing in Afghanistan is not so dissimilar from what you see in Africa and other, 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 other places. And then added to that, I think there is uh, uh, significant reluctance uh, to be uh, militarily en engaged in general uh, in, in Chinese foreign and security, security policy. <clears throat> um, 
I think also that there are some, uh, uh, as I suggested earlier, some, there is some ambivalence about, uh, about Afghanistan and our role there and being engaged with us, with us there directly, I think. Um, you know, uh, you know think, for, think for a second. The Chinese are very concerned about uh, Uyghur separatism in Xinjiang pro province. Um, but where would you rather see, if you're in Beijing, where would you rather see Uyghur, Uyghur fighters engaged? In Xinjiang or in Afghanistan or elsewhere? Thanks, Owen Sanderson, CSIS. Uh, I was wondering, by ramping up infrastructure on this modern Silk Road, you're improving licit traffic, but you're also creating a capability for illicit <coughs> traffic uh, traveling across the gap. How do you combat that and uh, ensure the sustainability for licit materials? Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll remark that um, the, the traffickers have no need for improved infrastructure for illicit goods. They've been moving this stuff very well, very quickly, often with a, a cooperation from officials in government across the region. There's no doubt about it. The governments in these regions have uh, friends and, and others who are involved in the trafficking, in narcotics trafficking. Uh, so improving the infrastructure um, is, it definitely has a greater impact on the, on the illicit side. Will it mean that people are sending more on the trucks and trains and planes that are part of this? Potentially. Um, but they, it, you know, people always say it's impossible to set up a, a modern tra transportation trade network out of there. Nothing can be done. Well, they are doing things. They're moving 8,000 tons of, uh, of opium heroin out of this country every year. So it, it's there. I, I don't think it impacts that significantly, though. Andy and I did hear an interesting anecdote from one of our uh, interviewees, and that was um, that there's a fear among some that by increasing the amount of train travel, into the area that people who currently traffic narcotics on the airplanes will lose business to those who would then recognize the opportunity to traffic on the trains. So that, that is amazing, but uh, nonetheless the reality in some of the places we've looked at. But they, they have no problem moving that, that uh, throughout the region. Add, add one, one thing that's been, it's been a concern all along with, with the project for sure, Owen. Uh, anec anecdotally, um, you know, most of the, uh, the containers that are, are coming into Af Afghanistan via the new routes are uh, via rail. And uh, recently uh, raised the question with um, a CENTCOM and TRANSCOM, well, what happens to these containers when they, uh, when they get to Afghanistan? Then what, what are they, when they, when they go back, what, what, are they, what, are, what do they carry? You know, um, I mean, one of the one of the concerns there being that they may be you know could be used for illicit uh, purposes. Well, to this point, none of those containers are coming back because there's such a supply shortage of of, uh, of storage space in Afghanistan that they're all staying there and being used as storage space uh, for now. <laughs>